Oscillations is a very important chapter, not for your exam, not just for your exam. It's uh, important throughout physics because oscillations are related to waves. Waves are nothing but oscillations. And light travels in the form of waves. Sound travels in the form of waves. You have electromagnetic waves, which means you have magnetic waves and electric waves. So almost everything in physics propagates in the form of a wave. And waves are nothing but oscillations. Therefore, this chapter is very important, especially for 2426. This is the most important chapter. Okay? Uh, in fact, we do not study waves here. We study waves in 2426. So it's a direct connection from here to that. Another thing why oscillations are important is because you know atoms and molecules are vibrating. Did you know that? If you have a diatomic molecule, the atoms are vibrating about the bond axis and as well as rotating. So all materials have atoms and all atoms are oscillating. So what can I say? Oscillations are very important. But we'll be chiefly talking about two examples for oscillations. One will be a lab that you're going to do where you have a spring and at the bottom of the spring you have a mass attached. And you pull it down, you know what's going to happen. It's going to oscillate up, up and down, right? So that's one example. The second example will be a simple pendulum. Do you know what a simple pendulum is? A string with an object attached, you pull it to one side, it'll swing back and forth. So this will be the two examples that we use. So let's uh, get started with this spring. So you have a spring with a mass attached. And right now what you see is the mean position. That is the equilibrium position. That is the undisturbed position. OK? Now, if you pull it down and let it go, it's going to go up and down between the two points, A and B. So A and B are the extreme positions, and that's called the amplitude. A and B, those positions are called the amplitude, which means maximum displacement from the mean position. So A and B are amplitude, and C is the mean position. So if you study this in slow motion, just tell me this. Is the displacement a function of time? Yes. What do you mean by displacement in this case? Displacement is when this thing is going up and down, right? So let's say it's at this point, at one instant. Your displacement is always measured from C, so your displacement would be that much, which is a positive quantity now. But if it's here, displacement is now negative because it's below C. So x is a function of time, and x could be either positive or negative, and it can take values between 0 and A. Well, I'm saying A is the amplitude, OK? A is the amplitude. So x is a function of time. It takes values from 0, OK, it goes from plus A to minus A. Is that clear enough? Kx. Well, what's k? A physical negative kx. K is called the spring constant. And we're going to use the same equation to begin with. So f is minus kx. But we do know that uh, force is mass times acceleration, according to Newton's second law. And so on the left-hand side, you have m d squared x by dt squared. That is mass times acceleration, isn't it? Minus kx. Same thing. OK, now I'm going to divide all terms by mass and rearrange to get this equation. So 
See what has happened? Divide both terms with the mass. So obviously mass gets cancelled from this term and then you find it here. Okay. And then I switch sides. That's it. Uh, do you believe that this is a constant? Because K is a constant, M is, of course, the mass of the object here, and it's a constant. Remember that in all these discussions, we are not considering the mass of the spring, which means this is a very light spring, which again means its mass, the mass of the spring, is negligible compared to the mass attached. Okay, so this is a limiting case. We are not considering the mass of the spring. Now, if that's a constant, then this is a differential equation where I'm going to use the term omega squared there, which you won't understand right now, but hold on. And you know what omega is? What does this symbol omega stand for? Where did we first hear about it? It was in circular motion. What is it? Angular, angular velocity, otherwise called angular frequency. Because you know omega is 2 pi times the linear frequency. You know all that, correct? So it's the same omega coming in here, and I'm going to prove it. Right now you don't know. I could have used any letter there, isn't it? And suddenly you're saying, like, why should you use omega squared? You will know. But that's a constant. I've decided to use that. So what's omega? Square root? K divided by m, isn't it? Come on. Because in place of this, I put omega squared. So, omega squared is equal to k by m, omega is square root of k by m. How do you find time period from omega? What do you mean by time period? Time period is the time taken for one oscillation, which means the time that it takes to go from A to B back to A. That's what you mean by one oscillation. Uh, what's the relation between period and omega? Somebody? What? Okay, <laughs> you got it. T is 2 pi divided by omega. So I'm going to get the formula for time period. I'm writing that equation again because it's on the other slide. You have already written it. I want you to see it. So... Oh, hold on. What I said is true, but I didn't write that right now. I'm taking another path. If that's a differential equation, look at that. What's the variable there? What's the variable? X. And didn't I already tell you X is a function of time? We know that. So we're going to assume a solution. We're going to assume that X is A cos omega t. Just going to assume x is a cos omega t. We could have taken it as a sine omega t. But, and what's a there? What is a? What is a here? I don't know. It's actually the amplitude, but it could have been any letter, right? It's a constant. Amplitude is a constant. And omega is in the picture too. So if x is a cos omega t, go ahead and find out dx by dt. Go ahead. If x is a cos omega t, find dx by dt. What's the differential of cos theta? Negative, huh? sign. Negative sign. And because omega is a constant, don't you have to write that again? So it will be dx by dt is negative a omega sine omega t. Anybody with me? All right, you'll have to write omega again because omega is a constant, right? So you've multiplied with a constant. Go ahead, take the second derivative, please. Take the second derivative. Find d squared x by dt squared. What's the differential of sine omega t? Cos omega t, right? Cos omega. But you will have to multiply with omega squared, I mean with omega again. So that will make it omega squared, yes. And you get to minus a omega squared sine, I mean cos omega t. Does anybody see anything there in that? It's funny if you don't. Watch. Do you see A cos omega t? Isn't that nothing but x? So the next, can I write this as minus omega squared x? There you go. So now, just now I proved, 
I proved that if you take the, if you assume the solution is x is a cos omega t, you get back to the differential equation that you started with, which should make a lot of sense, correct? Is that okay? Now what we're going to do is, we're going to compare oscillations with circular motion. Right now, you don't know what the relation is. At least, you know, omega has come in, right, crept in from that chapter. So there must be a relation. Consider uh, the comparison between oscillations and circular motion. You know that uh, counterclockwise rotation is positive, right? Counterclockwise is positive. So imagine <coughs> those are the two diameters. And imagine that an object starts rotating from here. Watch this. Starts rotating from here in the counterclockwise direction with a constant angular velocity, OK? By the time, look, when this object is at this point, if you draw a perpendicular to this diameter, this one, wouldn't this be that line? Correct? OK, when this object reaches here, if you draw a perpendicular now, wouldn't this be the line? Mm -hmm. Now, what's the foot of the perpendicular, if you know the meaning of feet? When the object is here, the foot of the perpendicular was here. When the object reached here, it's reached here, correct? Mm -hmm. OK, keep going. When the object is here, where is it? Isn't it here? the perpendicular that I'm drawing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's actually called the projection of circular motion. You know what a projector does, right? So you are projecting circular motion onto the diameter of the circle. And what did you see happening when the object went from here till here? What did the projection do? Didn't it go from here right up to there? Mm -hmm. All right, continue. By the time this rotates back, what's happening to the projection? It comes back. And then that means by now you know, by the time the object makes one rotation, the projection had made, has made one oscillation. Let's see the hands of those who got that. A few. OK. I, I can't. Can I reach there? I can't. So what I'll do is, I'll draw a circle here and try to shoot. Quick. That's the time required. Watch, left hand and right hand. This is the last chance. That's all, finished. <laughs> the, the right hand was showing the circular motion, the left hand was showing the projection. So you can define, and actually this type of an oscillation is called a simple harmonic oscillation. Simple harmonic oscillation. Oscillation. That's not show, it's simple harmonic oscillation. I think this is the time when I should ask you this question. If I go crazy about you, your grades, I mean, crazy about your grades and start walking from this wall to that one and back again and time myself perfectly, like I take 10 seconds to go from here to there, back again 10 seconds, will that be an oscillation? Open your mouth and talk. <laughs> Is, will that be an oscillation? Very good. That will not be a simple harmonic oscillation. That is just a to and fro motion. That's an oscillation, but it's not simple harmonic. Because for any oscillation to be simple harmonic, two conditions have to be satisfied. And we've already got the conditions. If you may open your eyes and look. What's on the left-hand side? What's this? Uh-oh. -uh. Acceleration, what's this? Displacement from the mean position, isn't it? What's the relation between them? You have a constant here, so what's the relation between them? They are proportional. So in simple harmonic oscillation, condition number one, acceleration is always proportional to the displacement. Acceleration is proportional to the displacement. What does that mean? That means when the displacement becomes maximum, Acceleration also becomes maximum. That means when the displacement is zero, the acceleration is 
Zulu. Now, can I walk like that? I can't. I mean, all I could do is walk at a constant rate or something like that, right? I can't typically copy that. The second condition is in that equation. Can anybody tell me what the second condition is? Look carefully at the same equation. The second condition is there in that equation. Thank you. It's in the opposite direction because of the negative. Remember, both are vectors. Acceleration and displacement are vectors, correct? So which means when the object is going up, what's the direction of the acceleration? Down. When the object is going down, the acceleration is? Oh, hold on a minute. That means the acceleration is always towards the mean position. Did anybody see that? The acceleration is always what? That's why the object is coming back. And that is why at the highest point, wait a minute, at the highest point, the amplitude position, what is its velocity? Okay, what do you know about its acceleration? Just use the words maximum or minimum. Please be careful. Please be careful. At the amplitude, is the acceleration maximum or minimum? Maximum. 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 Yet the velocity is? Zero. Now you know why. Because acceleration is this way and velocity is the other way. So when the acceleration became maximum, the velocity became what? Zero. It's just like somebody trying to run away from me. The, when I exert maximum force on him, he will stop and come towards me. Do you see that? He's trying to run away from me. And let's say I have an elastic rope or something, and then I start increasing the force, and then he stops and returns. You see that? So that's the math here. Now, in the math class, you stop at that. But in the physics class, you have to get the physical meaning, which is what I'm trying to give you now. Got everything so far? Okay, let's complete the story. That's counterclockwise. I told you that the projection... Okay, do not draw that. I'm going to change that. One second. Yes. Uh, you have to take the projection on this diameter for it to be perfect. So you're taking the projection on... DE, because we used x is equal to a cos. You see that? We could have used, didn't, did anybody hear me when I said you could have used x is equal to a sine? Mm -hmm. okay, okay. Now from that right triangle, what is cos theta? What is cos theta from this right triangle? Write it down, please. What is cos theta? Okay, what is this? What is this? Isn't that the radius of the circle? Wouldn't that be the amplitude? Yes, that would be the amplitude CE, correct? And X is changing. It can take values from 0 to the maximum. So what's cos theta? I'm not moving until you say it. What's cos theta? X over amplitude. Amplitude, thank you. Cos theta is x over amplitude. So x is a cos theta. Why did it suddenly become omega t? Because omega is theta by t, and theta is omega t. How many equations coming in? That's how we defined omega. Nobody remembers this? Omega is theta over t, so what's theta? Okay, that's why I replaced the cos theta with omega t suddenly. Why am I doing all this? I want to get an equation for velocity. I want to get an equation for velocity, right? From x, how do you get velocity? We already did it. Differentiated with respect to time, we already did it. I'm saying, I'm going back to that circle. If I take sine theta, what will I get? I want you to see both. Will that be sine theta? Of course. Square root a squared minus x squared by a. <coughs> so now dx by dt. Yeah, dx by dt. What was the equation you got for dx by dt? 
was it minus a omega sin omega t stop tell me yes okay substitute for sin omega t please Substitute for sine omega t. Tell me what you get. Now substitute for that. And then simple. You see that a term gets cancelled. Which one? A gets cancelled. And what do you have? So that's A omega. Substitute for sine omega t. Cancel the A's. And you have your equation. That is the formula for velocity. Please underline that. Velocity is minus omega square root a squared minus x squared. Uh, once again, let me ask you, what's the variable here in this equation? What's the variable in this equation? x. OK, what are the values it can take? Give me the limits. x can take. Zero. Okay, wait. Let's stop there. If x is zero, what do you have on the right-hand side? Square root a squared. I think it's square root a squared. Yeah, square root of a squared is a, so you'll have a omega. Isn't it? That's going to give you the maximum value of velocity. So if you put x is equal to zero, you're going to get the maximum value of velocity. What about if you put x is equal to a? If you put x is equal to a, what do you get? Correct. Velocity is zero. We know that it's zero. At what point? At the amplitude, because it's going to return. And now we know, we, we already knew this, but we got the math, that it's moving fastest when it's crossing the mean position. Is this making sense? So it stops and goes fast, slows down, again stops, so you're getting the formulas for Vmax and minimum. V max is omega, A, V min is zero. And maximum is when X is zero, minimum is when X is equal to A. Okay, go ahead and find the equation for acceleration. Give me the formula for maximum acceleration, minimum acceleration, I'll give you two minutes. Now for acceleration, D squared X by DT squared is minus omega squared x. So just put x is equal to 0 and x is equal to a, you'll get both the values. Max, that's the maximum value. The minimum value is, of course, 0. I just wanted you to look at this carefully. The maximum for acceleration happens when x is equal to a, yet the maximum for velocity happens when x is equal to zero. Did you notice that? Well, they're opposite to each other. We've already been saying that. When one becomes maximum, the other becomes minimum. That's it. OK. okay. For a spring, omega is square root k by the mass. So time period is 2 pi square root of m by k. So what are the two factors on which the time period depends? Mass, mass attached. How does it depend on mass? The bigger the mass, proportional to the square root of mass. So if you quadruple the mass, the time period doubles. Did anybody hear me? OK. So if you increase the mass, four times, the time period only increases because it's square root. And what else does it depend on? The spring constant, but inversely proportional. So if you have a tight spring, like the suspension springs of a car, tight spring, force constant big, then how is it going to oscillate? Is it going to oscillate like this? Or is it going to go one or two? Two, time period should be small. If k is big, time period is small. Did you get that? Inversely proportional. You're saying time period is small, which means the frequency is big. Goodness. 
This is what some people, what do you mean by frequency? The number of oscillations made in one second. And the relation between period and frequency is this. So obviously, if the period is small, the frequency is big. It's not so tough to understand. If the period is small, then it's making more number of oscillations in a second. If the period is big, oh, then frequency is small. So be careful when you work out problems. So again, I'm going back to the original question. What's surprising? Nothing? Come on, look at that equation and tell me what's surprising. Okay, in the case of the simple pendulum. Again, once again, we have to consider that the string is inelastic in the sense it won't stretch. And the mass must be a point mass. It cannot be a bucket of water. <laughs> you know, it should be a point mass. And the weight acts vertically downwards. Weight is mg. It's resolved into two components. If that is theta, this is also theta. This is mg cos theta. And this component is mg sine theta. And uh, just like I told you, it is mg sine theta that is responsible for the oscillations. Therefore, we only look at that. The force is mg sine theta. Technically, I should have put minus mg sine theta because does anybody see that mg sine theta is opposite to x? Come on, because x is going to be, watch, isn't x going to be from here that way? But mg sine theta is opposite. So I didn't put that negative. Technically negative. Okay. Find the value of sine 10 degrees. And come on, go ahead in your calculator. If theta is small, then sine theta equal to theta. I explained it. So now I can write mg theta. <laughs> Not enough. How do you define angle? The radius. Thank you. Length of the arc divided by the radius. Somebody, look at this diagram. Isn't it the length of the arc x? And the radius is the length of the pendulum? Correct. Okay, so theta is x divided by the length of the pendulum. But on the left-hand side, you have force, and you know force is mass times acceleration. So all I did is Substituted to force, right? Master, and cancel the masses. And rearrange these two terms with a purpose, and you will see why. Did anybody see why? Do you see that this is a constant? Mm -hmm. Now do you see that this corresponds with the general equation of simple harmonic oscillation? Oh, do you remember the general equation? D squared x by dt squared is what? <laughs> what should appear here? Oh. Correct. And I already told you that I should have taken a negative here. Imagine? Yes. Okay, so we should have had a negative, so sorry for that. But in any case, we know now that this is in place of omega squared. Did you understand that? Mm -hmm. If you did, then you know that omega is square root g by the length. And therefore, the time period is 2 pi by omega, which is square root L by G. That's the equation for time period of a simple pendulum. So what are the factors on which the time period of a pendulum depends on? The square root of the length, isn't it? and the acceleration due to gravity. So if you take a pendulum clock, oh my goodness, have you even seen those pendulum clocks? Mm -hmm. We used to have one in the 70s, and in summer, being the oldest in the home, it was my job to adjust it. Why do you have to adjust a pendulum clock in summer? It's made of a metal. It expands. So the center of mass goes down, and when the length increases, what happens to the time period? Increases. And you know how a pendulum clock works? For half an oscillation, it's one second, which means the time period is two seconds. You heard me? Yeah. And in summer, when the length increases by 2%, just 2%, maybe 1%, it's so small, that's enough 
to upset the time period from 2 to 2.002. You heard me? That's how much time it loses in one oscillation. And in a day, approximately it makes 43,200 oscillations. 86,400 seconds in a day. And so multiply 43,200 by that difference. At the end of the day, you have lost 10 minutes, which is a big deal. If you don't correct it, in six days, you lost one hour. So I would have to go and, I mean, and the, the bob, you know, it's a flat metal piece, if you've seen it. It's supported by a, a screw there, which you can move up and down. So I would have to slowly move it up. I would move it up. That's trial and error. And then find that the next day it's, it's gained 15 minutes because I moved it up. So bring it back down. And by the time I get to, you know, get it in position, it's winter. So I like to do it. <laughs> now, the, why did I put it that way? Because that was the first pendulum clock. Somebody walked into a church where they had those big, huge lamps hanging. There was no electricity at the time. The wind was blowing, and this was moving up and back and forth. And somebody said, we can use this to measure time. Because up until this time, the Egyptians had the, what do you call it, the hourglass. Mm -hmm. That's all we had. Until somebody said, ah, you can use. But we've come a long way from there into the quartz watch. Does anybody know what that is? The automatic watch that I'm wearing, show off. Anyway, because it winds itself, it's a cheap one. And then into the atomic clocks, you see, where, wow, it's so accurate that if it loses 0. 0.0002 seconds, we're not happy now. But it all began with the simple pendulum. What's surprising in this equation? Wait, another thing. If you take it to the moon, what's going to happen to the time period? Oh, no, you can't take a pendulum clock to the moon <laughs> because the acceleration due to gravity is one-sixth of that on the Earth. The time period is going to be really big, big. You can't take it. You understood. What's surprising here? The time period does not depend on the mass attached. Look at that. Does it depend on the mass attached? You can have 10 grams or one kilogram. Who cares? Does it depend on the amplitude? Technically, yes. Remember, we started with condition. I told you this formula works only if the angle is like 10 degrees or less. Good. Okay. So kinetic energy, as we have written, is one half times the mass times velocity squared, and velocity is omega squared root a squared minus x squared. When you square it, the root is gone, and that's what you get for kinetic energy. Now, what's the formula for total energy? Uh, yes, total energy is kinetic energy plus potential energy, but that's of no use for us now, because you don't know what potential energy is. So there's no fun in... But the idea is, if you can give me the formula for total energy, you can get that for potential, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I'm asking you, and you do know the formula for total energy. You do know. You just have to think. I'll help you. At the highest, at the amplitude position, what is its kinetic energy? Thank you. That means all its energy is potential, correct? What's the potential energy at that point? Maximum. Give me the formula for that. Didn't you say potential energy is generally 1 half k x squared? Didn't you say that? Didn't you? What's x equal to at that point? A. So what's the total energy? One half k a squared. Does that make sense? Because at the amplitude position, kinetic energy is zero. It's not moving. So whatever is the potential energy should be the total energy. Come on now. So that's the total energy. If that's the total energy, go ahead and find the potential energy. What do you have to do? So, yeah, go ahead. I uh, did another thing there. I did not want to keep writing m omega squared all the time. So watch. Do we know this? Do we know this? Omega square root of k by? If you square it, wouldn't I get that k is m omega squared? So I didn't want to keep writing m omega squared all the time, so I put it as k. That's all I did. Okay. So total energy is, because that's the k here as well. Otherwise, you won't make that connection, <laughs> you know. 
You see the K here? That's m times omega squared. So potential energy is is what? <coughs> the total energy minus the kinetic of course you know that the half k squared will get cancelled when you distribute it, wouldn't it? and then you have two negatives that make it a positive you see the negative here and here, right? so that'll make it Okay. the first term gets cancelled and then you get that. So that's the formula for potential energy. Can you draw a graph of a graph representing all the three, kinetic, potential, and total energy? A graph with, on the x-axis, you have the displacement. On the y-axis, you have the energy. Let's, let's try it. Let's see whether you can get it. On the, on the x-axis, you take displacement. So that's your mean position. That's your caps A, negative A, you know, amplitude position. And on the y-axis, we have energy. Can somebody, can somebody draw the graph? Will it be a straight line? Look at the equations. Look at the equations for kinetic energy, potential. Look, look at the equation for potential energy. Does that look like a straight line, equation for a straight line? Yeah. What is it going to be? Quadratic. Very good. It's quadratic, so the shape is going to be? Parabolic. Parabolic. Yes? Um, is it just a minus minus makes the x a positive? Which one? So, is it a minus minus makes the x a positive? Yes, yes, okay. yes. So how will the graph look like? It looks like this. You have two graphs. Tell me which one is the potential and which one is the kinetic. I stopped it right on time. The cup-shaped one, you know, normally cup is open up. So the cup-shaped one upwards is the potential. potential. Correct? Because, you know, it's zero at the mean position and maximum at the amplitude. This is the kinetic, definitely. Why? Because it's zero at the amplitude. Okay, good. Go ahead and draw the graph for total energy. You got to do something. Come on. Draw the graph. For to yes, Forrest. Total energy. What do you know about total energy? It's a constant. What is the formula for total energy? One half K A squared. And wouldn't the total energy be equal to the maximum potential energy and the maximum kinetic energy? Yeah. Because when one becomes max and the other is zero, therefore the total is equal to one of them. Come on now. So don't you know where to draw that straight line? Yes. So that's potential energy, that's kinetic, and that's the total. It's a constant. How exciting. What other subject can come close to this? I challenge everybody. There's no way. Okay, <laughs> now wait. You do want a little thing. Find the displacement at which both become equal. That is, the potential energy and kinetic energy are equal. They have to be equal somewhere, right? Okay, find the value of x for which potential and kinetic are equal. Let me show you in this graph where they are equal. I'm sure you know. Watch. Isn't this this point? Isn't it the point where they are equal? Watch this. Although I drew it, you know, real rough, it's not midway. Isn't that midway? Oh, if that's the mean, that's the amplitude, isn't this halfway? Did they become equal halfway? Nope. It's more than a half. Maybe through your minds it was going, you know, you're halfway. <laughs> you know, that's why I just said no. Find out. I'll give you two minutes. Put the equations for potential energy and kinetic energy equal to each other. That's why I said the answer is in the question. Okay. Potential energy is one-half K X squared, isn't it? And kinetic is 
when half k a squared minus x squared. Is that right? Cancel the half and the k. Bring that negative x squared to the other side becomes 2x squared is equal to a squared. I didn't write all that. And so x is a by square root of 2. And square root of two, 1 by square root of 2 is 0 